Hello, welcome to You Have My Sword. We are talking about the Undying Lands this episode, the Maybelline of realms. Maybe she's born with it, maybe it's immortality. The only realm where skincare is optional. Let's talk about it. The Undying Lands were a realm inhabited by the Einar, a realm that went by many names, which in true Tolkien fashion gets confusing quick. For context, the Einar, also known as the Holy Ones, were beings encompassing both the Valar and the Maiar. They were the very first and mightiest beings created by Eru Iluvatar, who is essentially the original creator long before the beginning of the world. And for some reason, I kind of picture Iluvatar as like Galactus from Marvel Comics. But instead of eating planets, he's creating them. But I picture him looking sick as fuck, kind of like Galactus does. <laughs> so anyways, this area included the continent of Amon and the nearby island of Tol Aresia. The ocean called Belaguer separated the Undying Lands from the western shores of Middle-earth. So hopefully that gives you logistically some context. Uh, only immortals and ring bearers were allowed to live in this realm. The Undying Lands was a name for Amon, or at least the part of it that was inhabited by the Velar, Maiar, and the Elves. The Quenya name Amon also means blessed land, or blessed, free from evil, or the unmarred state. Its Sindarin equivalent is Avon, translated also to mean unmarred state. For context, uh, Quenya is the language of the Quendi non-Teleran elves that reached Valinor. Quenya is spoken in Valinor and among the remnants of the Noldor in Middle-earth, uh, the Grey Havens, and in Rivendell. Sindarin is the language of one of the groups of elves that tried to make the journey to Valinor but got lost along the way. The etymology of the name Amon changed over time in Tolkien's writing. Amon was also called the Ancient West, Blessed Realm, as well as the Undying Lands, or simply just Valinor. In Adonaic, otherwise known as the language of the West spoken largely by the men of Numenor in the Second Age, it was called Amathani. In The Hobbit, Tolkien also calls this continent Fairy in the West, which is just about the cutest shit I've ever heard in my life. Author Robert Foster said in his foreword in his book titled The Complete Guide to Middle-earth that he did not provide death dates for protagonists who sailed to the West, quote unquote, for they still live. So many people seem to infer that mortals do live forever once they reach the West. But Tolkien has been quoted as saying that he seems to have been initially unsure if mortals who sailed to the West would remain mortal. Now I'm going to read two excerpts from letters in which Tolkien wrote on the matter to try and give some context here. Um, I barely know how to read, so bear with me. Okay, so Tolkien wrote, Certain mortals who have played some great part in elvish affairs may pass with the elves to elven home. I have said nothing about it in The Lord of the Rings, but the mythical idea underlying is that for mortals, since their kind cannot be changed forever, this is strictly only a temporary reward, a healing and a redress of suffering. They cannot abide forever, and though they cannot return to mortal earth, they can and will die of free will and leave the world. So this is interesting. So Tolkien is essentially saying that, you know, they can go over there and heal from corruption, uh, but it does not make them immortal going to the undying land but it does heal them, it extends their lifespan, and then they can choose to die, if that makes sense. Now, Tolkien also wrote in a letter, Frodo was sent or allowed to pass over sea to heal him, if that could be done before he died. He would have eventually to pass away, no mortal could or can abide forever on earth or within time. 
So for those wondering why Bilbo and Frodo got on that ship at the end of the films, it wasn't because they were cast to be on the next season of The Deadliest Catch. It's because the gods that inhabit Amon grant access to ring bearers to help them heal from the ring's corruption and extend their life for an undetermined amount of time. The Undying Lands were called that due to their inhabitants and not because they granted immortality. So there's a confusion here with the Undying Lands with mortals thinking they can go to the Undying Lands and then become immortal, but it is called the Undying Lands because immortals live there. Other important arguments against the immortality of mortals who sail to Amon can be found in, other, in another letter which cites, As for Frodo or other mortals, they could only dwell in Amon for a limited time, whether brief or long. The Valar had neither the power nor the right to confer immortality upon them. Their sojourn was a purgatory, but one of peace and healing, and they would eventually pass away, die at their own desire and of free will, to destinations of which the elves knew nothing. So this is actually really interesting to me. So, elves live essentially forever. They are immortal. And if they did perchance die, whether in battle or whatever, their souls go to the Hall of Mandos, essentially a heavenly purgatory where they kind of idle until they possibly re-enter life at some point in a sort of reincarnation. Men, though, and other mortals, they don't know for sure where they go when they die. They don't essentially know what their heaven would be. For me, personally, Heaven would be watching Erwin take her helmet off in slow motion after she shanks the Witch King in perpetuity. That shit lives rent-free in my mind. Okay, let's talk a little about Amon in the Second Age. Uh, the Amazon Lord of the Rings series is set to take place in the Second Age, by the way. There seems to be a lot of confusion around that production. I admit I am confused on if it's even happening or not. Hello, Jeff Bezos. But from what I understand, uh, the Amazon Lord of the Rings adaptation is to be set in the Second Age. So let's talk a little bit about some events that happen in the Second Age. So originally, mortals were allowed to trade with those from Valinor in the Undying Lands, but were forbidden to sail west beyond the site of the island of Numenor. However, Sauron deceived the king of Numenor, trying to tell him that anyone visiting the Undying Lands would be granted immortality. Of course, being men and being inherently problematic, the king of Numenor set sail to invade Valinor. To prevent the king's invasion, Iluvatar destroyed Numenor by flooding it and pushing it beneath the ocean and set the Undying Lands forever beyond the reach of mortal men. Like, how badly do you have to fuck up that God sinks your fucking island? Truly insane to me. Now, elves were still permitted to sail across the sea to the Undying Lands if they chose to, which most did, just to flex. With that said, I hope Amazon focuses on some of this in their series. I can't imagine they wouldn't, honestly. It's pretty important context and uh, a pretty huge event in the Second Age. But before we wrap up here, it is important to note also that Legolas and Gimli also set sail to the Undying Lands. Now, obviously, Legolas is let in due to him being an elf, but it is a rather huge deal that Gimli is let in. Elves and dwarves historically have not gotten along, and Gimli is the first dwarf to set foot in the Undying Lands, and it is highly speculated why. Tolkien has been quoted saying that it is in large part due to his efforts during the events of Lord of the Rings, as well as Galadriel giving Gimli her blessing as she took a shine to him. Gimli was not corrupted by the ring and essentially did not need to go to the Undying Lands to heal like the ring bearers did, but it is said that he wanted to go to look upon Galadriel again. And they say romance is dead. Come the fuck on. Gimli was often leveraged as comic relief in the films, which I did not hate, honestly, um, simply because I love Gimli so much. But he is much more of a substantial character in the books, in my opinion, which is why I adore him so much personally, and he is amongst my favorite characters. 
Um, so knowing that Gimli kind of gets to go to the Undying Lands and and see Galadriel again is um, very warm and fuzzy to me. Now, it is also rumored, but not certain, that Samwise also sailed to the Undying Lands after his wife Rosie died. This is told by his own daughter Eleanor in The Red Book. It is said that Sam was about 101 years old at the time and was granted permission to go for the same reason Frodo and Bilbo were, as he was briefly a ring bearer. It is uncertain, however, how he got there, but it is kind of presumed it was on an elf ship with Círdan, who had escorted Bilbo and Frodo before him. And it is said that Círdan escorted elf ships west well into the Fourth Age, so logistically it would be possible for Sam to go. Now, I am not saying this is a fact. I can already feel people upset at me for mentioning this, but to that I say, Fuck off. Let Let people people believe believe Sam went to reunite reunite with Frodo. Frodo. You miserable miserable fucks. But a lot of people don't think Sam went over to the Undying Lands, so this is kind of a choose-your-own-adventure situation. I think it's nice to think that he had a nice time with his family and his wife, and when she passed, he then went over to the Undying Lands. It's nice to think about, but it is not, um, you know, it's speculated. It's not certain. And with that, that's the end of the episode. As always, I hope you learned something, and if you didn't, shh. I don't care. Check us out at youhavemysordpodcast.com for all social links and link to our Patreon. If you join our Patreon, you can hang out in Discord with me while I shriek about whatever fantasy book I'm reading or whatever game I'm playing. It would be nice to talk to you guys. As always, I want to shout out another Tolkien content creator. In this episode, I want to tell you guys about the YouTube channel, History of the Ages. You can find them on YouTube at History of the Ages. They've got wonderful and really engaging, comprehensive videos covering all sorts of Tolkien history, and it's narrated beautifully. You can also find them at historyoftheages.co.uk check them out and tell them I sent you, even though they don't know I exist. Thanks for listening. I will protect you all with my life. And as always, you have my sword. Hedgewick's Nebula.